Well, welcome, Body of Christ, on this 7th of June to Navigators, where we're looking at, of course, Father God, the Great Initiator. So let's go before the Lord in prayer as we do. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for this day, Lord. We thank you and praise you, Father God, for life itself. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for the Word, for the Spirit, for the Spirit of wisdom, Lord, and knowledge and understanding. Lord, that, that is quickened within us today, Lord, as we open up your book, the Bible, and as we begin to glean the mysteries that you have there for us, Father God, that have been there before the foundation of the earth to be revealed to us to today, in this day, as we give you praise and thanks for it all now, Father God, in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Now, I wonder, Father of Christ, how many of you can remember the scripture that we closed with last time? Well, it was Titus. It was the third chapter and it was the fifth and sixth verse. So if we could, let's turn to there and we'll review it again today as we start. Verse 5. He came to save us, not because of any virtuous deed that we have done, but only because of his extravagant mercy. He saved us, resurrecting, resurrecting us through the washing of rebirth. We are made completely new by the Holy Spirit whom he splashed over us richly by Jesus the Messiah, our life giver. Now at this time, I have a question for you once again. Now that the word of God has entered your heart, upon hearing it, how has the word begun to change who you are? Scripture tells us that we are being changed and transformed into the image of his glory. Are we resisting that change? Or are we welcoming it with its transforming us by the power of the Holy Spirit who gives us life? Are we then allowing God's word right here, right now, to transform us and change us? For this is why Jesus Christ came. Now, we've established, did we not, last time, that twice in the book of Revelation, Jesus refers to himself as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And of course, if we understand that in its full context, then Jesus is all things in between. Jesus is the beginning, and he'll come back at the end. And the in between times has been given to us to fulfill God's purpose, which is the restoration of all things through Christ and his church. Each and every one of us is born into this life, being given the opportunity to discover and to have a personal intimate relationship with the Trinity, the Godhead, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Each and every one of us has been given a will. And within the confines of our own will, it is given to us to freely discover the Trinity, the Godhead, and to establish our own intimate, personal relationship and connection to the Godhead through Christ. Now, I'm sure you know by now, body of Christ, that children are the heritage of the Lord. If you turn to Psalm 127, 127 and verse 3, it is there we read, children are God's love gift. They are heaven's generous reward. Then we read, train up your child in the way that they should go. We read that in Proverbs 22, 6 which reads, dedicate your children to God and point them in the way that they should go. And the values, the values they've learned from you will be with them for life. Now we see a, a startling truth presented to us by the Lord in Matthew 18, 1 through 5. Now listen Listen to these words very carefully, for they are cautionary words, as well as being very instructive words given to us by the Lord himself. 
Within them, if we have eyes to see, is great wisdom. Starting now with verse 1 of Matthew 18, 1. At the time the disciples came to ask Jesus, who is considered to be the greatest in the, kingdom of, in the kingdom's realm? Now just look at the delicate and intricate way that Jesus answers this self-seeking, self-serving, and penetrating question by the disciples. Jesus calls to himself a small child. Then he asks his disciples this very, very penetrating question in verse 3 and through to verse 5. In verse 2, we see that Jesus called a little one to his side and said to them, his disciples, those who have ears to hear, learn this well. Now, when Jesus said learn this well, it, it, it means that we have to hook into these words and take them to our hearts. Learn this well, unless you dramatically change your way of thinking and become teachable like a little child, you will never be able to enter in. Whoever continually humbles himself to become like this little child is the greatest one in the heaven's kingdom realm. And if you tenderly care, this I love this body of Christ, and if you tenderly care for this little one on my behalf, you are tenderly caring for me. Now there's so much divine teaching and instruction for us to glean from in the way that Jesus answered his disciples. I believe that Jesus is talking about innocence, innocence and self, innocence and selflessness here. In these verses. For one thing, children are colorblind when it comes to the different races of children that they play with, and they aren't born with any rancor or bitterness or resentfulness. Amen? And look at the instruction and direction that Jesus gives in verse 5. If you tenderly care for, these li for this little one on my behalf, you are tenderly caring for me. There are very few within the body of Christ who understand the selflessness that is required to do what Jesus is talking about here in this verse. We, the body of Christ, have so much to learn on this score of selflessness. Alas, selfishness is what is bred into us from a very early age and its roots, the roots of selfishness grow deep, so deep into our psyche that if we do not learn the way of mercy and truth, as we are shown in the book of Malachi, uh, Micah, sorry, Micah 6, 8, which reads, he has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord God require of you but to do justly and to love kindness and mercy, and to humble yourself and walk humbly with your God. He wants us, you know, Adam walked with the Lord God in the cool of the day. And this is what God wants for us. We see it right here. He wants us to humble ourselves and walk with our God, or walk with your God, which is our God. <clears throat> now it takes years and can, can be almost impossible without the guiding and directing, illuminating light of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's guidance to find our own way and our own path to the selflessness of the Godhead. I want you to think about that, body of Christ. Selflessness is the adhesive glue, if you will, that holds the Trinity together. The one prefers the other, the other prefers the other, and the other prefers the other. It takes a little while and a great deal of self-reflection for us to come to the place in God where we can see from Isaiah 40.10 that the end is reflected in the beginning. 
and that seeing and learning selflessness can only be taught or given by the Lord himself. We are reminded again in Hebrews 4.3, if you'll turn there with me, that God's works have all been completed. God's works have all been completed from the foundation of the world. That's why we read in Ecclesiastes, there's nothing new under the sun because God's works have been completed from the foundation of the world. Have you not understood from the foundation? Have you not been told from the beginning? Isaiah 40, 21, if you would, where we read in verse 21, you worshipers of idols, you are without excuse. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? These things ought to convince you of God's omnipotence and of the folly of bowing to idols. <clears throat> Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? To whom then will you liken God? And how are you going to see God through the smog and the fog of modern day Christianity? Or are you going to see God through the clarity of what is revealed within the Logos and within the Father in the beginning from the foundation? This is the time before man had any chance to speak anything defamatory or misguiding about God the Father. In rewriting, man began to rewrite his own story over the top of God's story. So scripture is telling us here that the works were finished. The works were finished before the foundations of the world. You and I were not only thought of, but known before the foundations of the world. That's Difficult for us to perceive and understand, but if we, if we ponder on it, we'll see that it is true. So the scripture is telling us here that the works that were finished before the foundations of the world. So turn with me, if you will, now to Ecclesiastes, to the third chapter. And let's have a look at verses 14 through 15, for it tells us in verse 14, I know that whatever God does... Remembering here, of course, that the works were finished before the foundation of the world. So whatever God does, it endures forever, declaring the end from the beginning. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. And God does it so that man will reverently fear him or be aware of him and recognize him as Lord and Savior, revere and worship him, knowing that he is. Verse 15, that which is now, listen, that which is now already has been, and that which is to be, that which is to be already has been, again, declaring the end from the beginning. And God asks that which has passed, or God seeks that which has passed by, so that history repeats itself. So we cannot add, nor can we take away from it, from the Word. So we cannot arbitrarily decide that our doctrines, which we men have made, cannot in any way supersede that which was done from the foundation, or the foundations. That, that which can neither be added to or distracted from. So... Whatever we discover from the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Spirit, and with the Holy Spirit, that originates from the foundations of the world, now listen, cannot be altered, cannot be altered by our history. Like the Adamic history that we've studied in trying to find out our own origins from within our own sphere of knowledge and understanding of who we are. Alas, it is a very fine line or a very fine wire 
upon which we walk. For us to truly perceive and seek truth as it was in the beginning, do you hear what I'm saying? For us to perceive and see truth as it was in the beginning, we need to have our minds renewed by the washing of the Word in the Holy Spirit, with the need to understand that which is now already has been, and that which is already, and that which is to be already has been. So for us to be able to understand this, we need to be fully awakened within our spirit to the full nature and character of our Father God. And that Father God lives and moves within the eternity of the eternities, coexisting with the other members of the Godhead within the realm of complete selflessness. Selfless is something that is so basically foreign to the makeup of man, that will need the enlightenment, enlightenment of selflessness itself to even begin our quest in understanding who Father God is, and subsequently, subsequently, who we are in Him. From that switch has already been done. From that switch has already been done. So, so who God is cannot be altered by history or by the futile thoughts of man or the misguided thoughts of humanity. We're going to have, we're going to move and have to move along to some of the things that are, are, that are recorded within the New Testaments of our Bible. Looking at some of those things which have been said or ought to be from the beginning, from the foundations, and we are possibly all going to be familiar with them because we have visited them many times before. And this is as we proceed within our teachings that we have done, and I'm hopeful that with the prescribed, with the prescribed relocation of thought that we will now be able to see and to hear these things with a spiritual ear without the customary, yes, but what about? The yes, but what abouts? We have a whole realm within ourselves of yes, but what about? Simply because, now listen, simply because we have not yet been able to perceive the beginning from the end in the mind of God. Questions that we have generated by those who would attempt to take away or to add to, to that which has already been established from the foundations and cannot be altered. Now hopefully today we're going to be able to appreciate all of these things from a clean room within our hearts and in a sterile environment to place to a place where the voice of man has not defiled the face of God with his words that of a sterile environment that has of yet not participated in altering the purpose and the plan of God to suit man Father God, as we know, is omnipotent and is om omnipresent, sorry, and omnis omnipotent. He's everywhere at all times. With his being all knowing, as we've highlighted before, he knows our thoughts before we even thought them out. He knows where we are going with our thoughts, he knows where we're going with our thoughts. And he meets us, meets us there at the end of our thoughts, right? He meets us there uh, with the answer. So as we've highlighted before, he knows our thoughts before we've even thought them out. He knows where we are going with our thoughts. And he meets us there if we have ears to hear the answer. Now, as we have said before, 
in Psalm 139, 1 through 6. Lord, you know everything there is to know about me. You perceive every moment of my heart and soul, and you understand my every thought before it even enters my mind. You are so intimately aware of me, Lord. You read my heart like an open book, and you know all the words I'm about to speak before I even start a sentence. You know every step I will take before my journey even begins. You've gone into my future. Isn't that beautiful? You've gone into my future to prepare the way. And in loving kindness, you follow behind me to spare me from the harm of my past. You have laid your hand upon me. This is just too wonderful, deep, and incomprehensible to understand. Your understanding of me brings me wonder and strength. So, body of Christ, we know that it was all established before the foundations of the world. Nothing of it can be changed or altered. So there is nothing about your life and mine that God is not aware of. Even tomorrow and next week, God willing, He knows where we're going and He knows what we're thinking and He knows what we're going to say. So the important thing for you and I, body of Christ, is that we always keep our mind focused on the Word of God. And as I say every week, walk with God, talk with God, and be with God every moment of every day of our lives. Can you see it now? And then we have King David, who goes on to say, Where could I hide from your spirit? Now turn with me now, if you will, to, to a familiar scripture, it is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and let's look at verses 6 through 7. Verse 6 starts, However, there is a wisdom that we continually speak of when we are among the spiritually mature. It's a wisdom that didn't originate in this present age, nor did it come from the rules of this age, who are in the process of being nor from the rulers, sorry, of this age, who are in the process of being dethroned. Instead, we continually speak of this wonderful wisdom that comes from God, hidden before now in a mystery. It is His secret plan, destined before the ages, to bring us into glory. So what we need to understand, body of Christ, is that Paul is referring to the gospel, which is the wisdom of God. So we will use this term, the gospel, as we proceed, as the wisdom of God. We see here the term used, this wonderful wisdom that comes from God, and hidden before now in a mystery. The question is, why was it hidden? Hmm. Well, let's now try and understand something here, okay? God hides nothing about himself. It was hidden from man because man's minds, being darkened as they are, and his futile thoughts kept man, kept him from understanding. God's grace gospel. So he kept man from understanding God's grace gospel and he was incapable of understanding Father God's plan for the salvation of men and the salvation of creation. Why then wouldn't Father God, why then would Father God hide it? Well again it wasn't hidden by God meaning it wasn't hidden by God with God waiting for Jesus to appear on the scene. So Paul tells us that the gospel was predetermined before the ages, in verse 7, and that it was predetermined before the ages, before the foundations of the earth, for our glory. Now here's something that we can glean, and something that we can learn here from Paul's words. Whenever we hear or see the Apostle Paul speaking or referring to the gospel, his gospel that was given to him, by revelation from God, that this is the gospel that was entrusted to him with 
to claim it among the Gentile nations in order to testify to the nations the grace of God. Now this is something that having ears to hear that we've learned about some time ago testifying to the grace of God. Now here's something else. Something else, else that we can learn whenever Paul is talking about the gospel. In that his gospel that he was given to him by God, his gospel always reflects the worth or the work I should say predetermined and finished before the ages. And it is a work that no man can add to or take away from, which is the message void of the questions of man. It is a message, it is a gospel devoid of the questions of man. This is what Paul has said. We preach the gospel in a mystery which Father God predetermined before the ages for our glory. 1 Corinthians 2.7 it was a message in and from God that was settled and it didn't need to be added to or taken away from. Are we able to see all of the pollutants that we breathe into our spirit and how bad these inhalants have been for our spirit? Anytime that we see the Apostle Paul reflecting on and referring to the gospel, there's one thing that we need to hold up before us to, and to remember. It is that the gospel that he preached always testified to and about the goodness of Father God, proclaiming that it always, it's always a message that was predetermined and set before the ages. Now, there are many scriptures in the New Testament that attest to this. And we're going to close with these scriptures today, body of Christ. But let's remember, before we go to these scriptures, that this is a gospel that was predetermined before the birth of Christ, before the death of Christ. It was predetermined before the foundations of the earth. So let's look at these scriptures in the New Testament that attest to this, that it was preset and predetermined before the ages. First one we'll go to is 2 Timothy 1.9. He gave us resurrection life and drew us to himself by his holy calling on our lives. And it wasn't because of any good thing that we have done, but by his divine pleasure and marvelous grace that confirmed our union with the anointed Jesus even before time began. And then we'll go, if you will, we'll turn to Romans 8, 29, 30. For he knew about us before we were born, and he destined us from the beginning to share the likeness of his Son. And the beginning is talking about before time began. This means the Son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like Him. Having determined our destiny ahead of time, He called us to Himself and transformed His perfect righteousness, transfigured or transferred His perfect righteousness to everyone He called. And those who possess His perfect righteousness, He co glorified with His Son. Now turn with me, if you will to Ephesians 1, 4 through 6, which reads, And in love he chose us before he laid the foundations of the universe. Because of his great love he ordained us, so that we would be seen as holy in his eyes with an unstained innocence. For it was always in his perfect plan to adopt us as his delightful children, through our union with Jesus, the Anointed One, so that His tremendous love that cascades over us would glorify <coughs> His grace for the same love He has for the beloved Jesus, He has for us. And this unfolding plan brings Him great pleasure. 
Now this unfolding plan was, was planned and determined before the ages, before the foundation of the world. Both you and I were in the center of his eye way back then. Now Ephesians 2.10, we have become his poetry. Now that word poetry is poly, uh, the Hebrew word, Greek word, sorry, polyma. So we become his poetry. Our lives are the beautiful poetry written by God that will speak forth all that he desires in life. A recreated, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each one of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one, even before we were born. God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we would do to fulfill it. Amen. So, body of Christ, I hope you've got a belly full there and that you're able to munch on it and chew on it and digest it and glean all that God has for us in the scriptures that we have just written. He knew about you. He knew about me. And he knew about our lives. He knew about what we're going to think. He knew about what we're going to speak. People who think it and speak it. He knows every intimate detail about us and he has directed us in the Holy Spirit towards Jesus. Hallelujah. So that we can learn about who, who's and what we are in him, in Christ Jesus. Brand new creations in Christ. Amen. So we'll leave it there for today, brother of Christ. I, I truly hope that you will ponder all that we've discovered and read today within the Word of God. And I pray that the Holy Spirit is ministering and speaking to each and every one of us about our commitment to the Word and unto the Lord. So again, body of Christ, until next time, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord God cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious, uh, gracious to you and give you His peace. Amen? Amen. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, how exhilarating, how exhilarating and uplifting and life-giving is your word. So, Father, we thank you for the uplifting word and the life-giving word that you have given to us today. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of Wisdom will work upon our spirit and work with our spirit to enhance our spirit and to cause our spirit to grow with all of the rhema and the logos that we have gleaned today from your word, transforming us and changing us into the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we give you all the praise for it now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen and amen. So, body of Christ, as I do every time, I encourage you and I exhort you to walk with God, to talk with God, and to be with God every moment of every day of your lives. Amen. So until the next time, shalom and God bless you and goodbye.